top of the class at US Naval Test Pilot School to test pilot at Saab. He knows what it takes to build a fighter that will keep pace with technical advances. Please give a warm applaud to Marcus Wandt. Thank you, thank you. All right. So what do we need to build a fighter? Or rather, what do we need to build a perfect fighter? What ingredients do we need? First, we want to use the fighter we're building to accomplish something. We want to create air power. And all the air power I've seen and all the missions I've flown have evolved using weapons and sensors. So let's start building today's perfect fighter by getting state-of-the-art weapons and state-of-the-art sensors. All right. We need to get those weapons and sensors somewhere to accomplish the mission. And we'll preferably, we want to know that we get there, and we want to get there fast. So let's get a really good and reliable engine. Then we want to have a way to tell our weapons and sensors what to do, and we want to have a way to communicate with our systems. To do that, we need human-machine interface hardware, such as displays and flight controls. So let's get state-of-the-art displays and state-of-the-art flight controls and the best system we can find out there for that. Then we want to have something shown on our displays, and we want to have something efficiently controlling our systems during the mission. So we need computers. So let's get the fastest and most stable avionics out there. <clears throat> All right, so we have weapons, sensors, we have thrust to move the kit, and we have a way of interacting and controlling our systems during the mission. Now we need to assemble everything, encapsulate it in a way suitable for combat. So let's build a really efficient low-drag airframe. Great. We have today's perfect fighter. We got all the best systems we could find. We made a perfect integration. Everything functions just as we wanted to. So we are proud and we are happy today. So uh, what will happen tomorrow? How do we stay ahead of the adversary when everything around us continuously evolves? How do we maintain our perfect fighter perfect? To make that analysis, we first have to establish where the real evolution and development is happening. Uh, so we'll walk through all the fighter ingredients again and look at them from an evolutionary and developmental perspective. So weapons, first one. Weapons evolve, uh, they improve, and they are, somewhat, they are uh, separate systems. So the weapon evolution is somewhat separated from the platform as well. Uh, a new weapon can change the game quickly if the platform is ready for quick adaptation and integration. An example of where we have seen a new weapon change the game uh, recently was seen in the air-to-air -air arena when integrating the Meteor missile on the Gripen, making it superior to another legacy fighter in the BVR combat. So let's establish that there is no real weapon evolution happening in the platform per se, but it's really important for us to be able to quickly and effectively make an integration of a new weapon on our fighter platform. Sensors. Sensors also involve, uh, evolve and improve. Uh, but the sensor hardware and the performance of the sensor hardware are still very much slaves under the laws of physics. So the radar equation is still valid. Most of the improvements being made today in the sensors lies in the computational part and the, and the signal processing of the sensor chain. Here it's important that we can update the algorithms and provide those algorithms with the data needed for them to perform. Moving on to thrust. Here's a plot showing thrust development from the 1940s to the 2000s. It shows maximum thrust delivered by the engine divided by the weight of the engine. And as you can see, it's improving, it's evolving, but it seems to be linear, and the rate is rather graspable. And that, in other words, you can say the difference between, you can predict at least, the difference between state of the art today and state of the art tomorrow. As an example, if you would extend this linear fit to the year 2030, you will see that we will have an in increase of approximately 15% in thrust to weight ratio from today to 2030. If you look at airframes and human machine interface hardware, the development seems to be approximately the same. In other words, 
it's predictable, and the rate is graspable. All right, so we looked at weapons. Uh, we looked at uh, sensors. We have to be good at integrating weapons. Sensors, uh, thrust, uh, airframes. Uh, we don't, there is no real quick evolution happening there. Uh, we have one system left which we haven't looked at. at. So there's one component uh, of our perfect fighter that stands out from the rest. And that's avionics. Here's a graph showing the uh, increase or the development of computational power from the 1960s. Uh, and if you look at it, and look at the time frame for the legacy fighters, that would be fighters such as F-15, F-16, F-18, in other words, fighters from uh, late 70s to early 80s. The increase in uh, computational power has been during that time frame 1,000 million times. That's a lot. And if you take that time frame and shift from today and into the future, the, the development of the computational power is estimated to be 1 million, million, million times. That's a big number. And that number is so big, it's really hard to wrap your head around. So this, is, this seems almost linear as well. Remember the plot of the, with the thrust? It's slightly accelerating, but this is on a logarithmic scale. What would it look like if we look at the, this data on a linear scale, like we did with the thrust development? Let's have a look from 1960s to 2020. That's only four years from now. Then it looks like this. It shoots off the chart. So why is that? Is there something special going on here between 2016 and 2020? No, it's not. This is just because you're plotting linear on uh, on a linear scale. So there is nothing specific going on here. This happens all the time, since development is continuously in a strong acceleration. So if we would plot this from the 1960s to the year 2030, it will look like this. You remember the shooting of the chart happening between, uh, between uh, 2016 and 2020? It appears flat. Flat compared to what's between 2025 and 2030. So what does that mean to us? What effect will an increase of a million, million, million times in computational power have? And what impact will uh, the development and evolution of algorithms during the coming 35 years have on air power? Who knows? I, I don't know, and uh, no one really knows. But what I do know, though, is that I don't want to be the pilot sitting in the fighter who is one million, million, million times slower than the adversary's fighter. So how do we ensure that we maintain our avionics relevant, even in the near future? We design a really, really smart avionics architecture. An architecture that allows us to rip out old algorithms and replace with new ones without having impact on other parts of the system. An architecture that allows us to replace uh, hardware often and easily in the avionics without having to change the applications running on it. By doing that, we're not only building the perfect fighter today, but we also ensure that we have the perfect fighter tomorrow. And by having this architecture, we enable truly short tactical upgrade cycles. And when you have that, you have the possibility to get inside of the adversary's decision loop and you can make sure to offset and counter their actions, and you can offset and strike from unpredicted angles. And when you get inside of the adversary's decision loop on several different levels, you will win. And doing this will not only allow us to keep pace with evolution, it would actually allow us to lead it. And this is what we have done. This is what we are building right now. And this is what will set Gripen apart from other fighters in the future. And this. This is how I build a smart fighter. Thank you.